Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see each and every one of you. My name is Dusty, and if I haven't had a chance to meet you, so great to welcome you. And all those that are watching online today, come on, Heartland family, help me welcome them to church. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out and turn to Acts chapter 2. No, not 3. Don't you get ahead of me. We'll get there. We'll get there. Hey, a couple of things while... Uh, we are, while you're turning there, uh, tonight's going to be such a special night uh, as we say a big thank you to every single one of you that serve on our dream team. And uh, we're going to feed you, we're going to make you laugh. Uh, but more than anything, my favorite thing is we get to honor uh, some of our volunteers, uh, our dream teamers that have gone over and above uh, just to say thank you. It's going to be a great night. And uh, getting all of our family in one little, little area and hanging out, it's going to be great. If you haven't registered, uh, make sure to do it for us. Uh, there's close to 300 of you so far that are already uh, going to be a part, so we're excited about that and uh, cannot wait. Uh, 6 p.m. tonight, and, uh, and the, the theme is television shows, so it's going to be great. And then this coming Wednesday night, we continue right along with our prayer, the prayer meeting. Uh, close to 150 of you came to pray this past week, and uh, I'm so grateful for the spirit that I feel in this room. It's really setting the stage for everything that's happening uh, on Sundays and throughout the week. So thank you. The prayer service is such a big deal. I'll talk about that more. And then uh, next weekend's really exciting. Uh, I have to tell you personally, it would, be, it would mean a great deal to me if you're in the room uh, next Sunday, and you're going to want to be in the room. Uh, because Pastor Kevin Gerald, uh, one of the, I, I really consider him to be one of the greatest communicators uh, on planet Earth. Uh, this is his first time to speak here, but hopefully will not be his last. Because uh, the week of March 3rd, we're going to be hosting Team Church, uh, which is a network uh, of churches that we're a part of. Uh, we're hosting a regional event, and so that whole week is kind of a special week for us as a church. With Pastor Kevin speaking that day, and then... On March 6th, that's a Wednesday night, we're doing what we call Big Wednesday. Everybody say big. big. Come on, it's going to be big. And so uh, Jonathan Moore is going to be in the room speaking that night. Uh, think like Seek Week. Uh, that's the kind of environment we're really going for uh, on this night. We're going to have food trucks outside. Like it's going to be a great night. I'm asking you to come for Big Wednesday, which is First Wednesday, but it's bigger than a regular First Wednesday. Uh, so we have prayer meeting, we have First Wednesday, we have Big Wednesday, we're just, we got all the Wednesdays around here, okay? And then uh, the next day on that Thursday, uh, we're hosting a Team Church Road event. We have over uh, 200 pastors that are going to be in this room the entire day on Thursday. We're going to get the opportunity to serve them pour into them. Uh, Pastor Kevin's staying over. He's going to be speaking to those pastors that week. And so listen to me. If you can give us that day, uh, we need about 20 or 30, 30 of you left. Uh, that's and, and we're going to be good. But if you can give us the day to help us love on pastors, spend time with pastors, serve here in this building, here's a QR code. Or just to make it really easy, go out to the lobby today and sign up out there. They'll help you figure out where and what it's going to look like. We'll train you, make sure you know what's going on uh, for the day. But it's going to be a, a really, really great week. And uh, I hope that you join us uh, for it. Cody mentioned the power I need. That's the series we're in right now. This is week chapter. Or this is week number six. Uh, finishing up chapter two today. And uh, for those of you who are new to our church, I felt like God spoke to me in July of last year and told me uh, that this was going to be a year of power in our church. And as I really pressed into the voice of the Holy Spirit, I felt like he asked me to basically teach you the whole book of Acts uh, for the entire year this year, uh, which is kind of insane. I've never done anything like that. But for 10 months, we're spending uh, um, the whole year uh, in the book of Acts. Now, let me tell you, we're going to take a little break We've done six weeks. We're going to kind of like collect our breath in the month of March. Uh, I'm going to take a couple of weeks and get ready for, for uh, Palm Sunday and Easter. And so we have some different voices that are going to be speaking into our church. Uh, and I think it's going to be great. You're going to love it, um, especially with Pastor Kevin next weekend and then some other voices. So we'll take a little break from the book of Acts. But then right after Easter, we'll dive back in, okay? And we'll just keep going for a few months, for several months. So I uh, hope you're ready for that. Uh, today, we're gonna spend some time studying one of my favorite sections of the book of Acts, the, the last few verses of Acts chapter two. And for those of you who are new in Acts chapter two, we've looked at how the Holy Spirit was poured out for the very first time. There has been this incredible move of God, power of God, people are getting saved, 
And over the next few uh, pages that are going to be, begin to follow in Acts chapter 3, 4, and 5, we're going to begin to see the gospel grow in that very first church. We're going to see life change begin to take place. We're going to see miracles performed. We're going to see the power of God uh, demonstrated firsthand to the people in the city. And the question is, is what happened? What did the apostles do that began to make it possible for God to do what he wanted to do? In other words, what kind of environment did these people create? Some people say, well, if God wants to do something, he'll just do it. But I'm here to tell you today, that's not always the case. Like, God's will is not automatically done. The Bible says that God is willing that none should perish, and yet some will perish. So God's will is not automatic. You and I have a responsibility to partner with God to be a part of that. Paul says in Philippians, it is God uh, who is now at work in you. Now work out your salvation with fear and, and with tribble, and trembling. So if God is at work, then we have to be active in our participation, in the work in us, in, in the place that we're a part of. And so the end of Acts chapter 2 shows us how all of these early church Christians began to formulate this church, and they had a, a deep responsibility that they felt to begin to lay the foundation for God to work. And, and I just, I want to say this from, from the outset today, like, like I feel like these mandates are all, should be cultural for us. I feel like, like I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to all my church people right now, like this is some stuff we got to get in our hearts if we want to see a move of God happen in our church. Amen, everybody? And, and not just in our church, but, but outside the walls of our church. But as I said this past Wednesday night at our prayer meeting, it's got to happen in us before it can happen through us. And, and so this has got to be a mandate that we feel. So let me give you today four responsibilities that we've got to embrace if we want to join God in building his great church. Amen, everybody? So this one, if you're taking notes, it's a, you're going to like it. It's real easy to take notes with. Four points. It's going to be a good one. All right, here we go. The, the four responsibilities in building God's great church. The first is vibrant worship. Now, let me, let me share something about this with you, okay? We often think of worship as people singing. We often think about worship as what happens when, when the music starts to play. And that is a part of worship. And I do believe there is a supernatural effect to our singing, like, like, please don't mistake this. As we begin to sing, I believe heaven is engaging with you in this place, that, that as we're worshiping, there are battles that are being fought, battles that are being won solely because of our worship. Things are being changed in the atmosphere. But worship is, is not just what we do when we sing. It's not what we do when we're in this room. Worship is how you live your life. Look at what Paul said in, in Romans chapter 12. He says, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. The kind will be acceptable. And then notice this next part. The bolded part says, this is truly the way to worship him. When you submit your life to Jesus, the, the logical response, the only right response is to live a life that glorifies God. That's worship, everybody. Worship is what happens in your life. It's what happens in your heart. It's what happens in your mind. It's what happens in your deeds. And it's what happens in this place. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I'm going to read this, and then we're going to talk about it. It says, All of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Now, right off the bat this morning, as we're looking at the scripture, I want you to see that it's all the believers. Come on, everybody say that with me. All the believers. It's everybody. And this is so important for us to note and to see. It wasn't just Peter. It wasn't just John. It wasn't the apostles doing this. It wasn't the pastoral staff doing this. 
This was everybody, all the believers. Let's just say this right off the bat. A move of God is not just the responsibility of leadership. It's a responsibility of everyone who calls themselves a believer. And I want you to note that they devoted themselves. They, they were all in. They, they were given to what was happening. It's like all the chips pushed in. We're all a part of this. See, vibrant worship starts with the people who have made the worship of God their top priority. This was a real devotion. Church was not something that they did if they didn't have anything else to do. Church wasn't something they did if they didn't have kids' games or if they felt, if they felt like going, if they woke up and it was a nice 80 degrees at the end of February. Come on, somebody. <laughs> It was the top priority. It wasn't just another priority. It was the top priority. They gave themselves to it. They loved to do it. They loved the church. And their whole life was involved in and being actively engaged in loving and being a part of the local church. Parents, can I talk to you for a second? One of the greatest things that you can ever teach your kids is to fall in love with the church. One of the worst things that you can do is to go home and criticize the church. It doesn't mean the church doesn't have faults. The church is not perfect. And, and we want to make sure, by the way, that we become aware and fix our blind spots. But if you kind of have an attitude that constantly points out faults, constantly tears down the church to your kids, it will become impossible for your kids to love it. The, the way that you teach them to love it is to be at it, <laughs> to spend time there, to celebrate what God is doing. Like a night like tonight, we're going back to church. Now your 12-year-old may say, we just went this morning. <laughs> yeah, but tonight's different. We're celebrating all the people who serve. We, we got to be a part of that because we love God's great church. People who are involved in church, let me just make sure you know this, just in case you, you thought this. They're not doing this because they're bored and they don't have anything else to do. They have other things to do. They just made this the greatest priority of their life. Like their lives are going to be built around the context of the local church. I was uh, at an event a couple of weeks ago in Florida uh, listening to John Maxwell, and I was talking with a couple of business leaders there, and they were asking me about, about our church, and I, I was telling them about the church. I told them how we were three generations of pastors, which is always a really big talking point. It's very, very rare for something like that uh, to exist. And so one of the guys we were talking, he said, so is it your desire that your girls would one day lead the church? And I said, man, I got to tell you, my, my desire is to make sure they love God and love his church. That's my desire. Like, that's how I know I'll be successful, is that they love me and they love you. You know what I'm saying? Because if they love God and if they love the church, then everything else will work out. But those are things that are most important. Teach your kids to love the church. Teach them to be passionate about the church, to be all in with the church. And, and by the way, you can't create in them what's not in you. I was a youth pastor for almost 13 years. You can't drop them off and tell them that you're passionate about it while you never go to it. You can't tell them it's important while demonstrating that it's not important for you. It'll never work. I, I'm just encouraging you to, to teach them to love the church, to love the Lord, to love his people, to celebrate what God is doing. Now, I want to go back to this verse for just a second because inside of this verse, I want you to notice that as they engaged in vibrant worship, the text shows us that they were devoted to three things within that. So this is kind of a sub-point of, of this first one, that, that they were devoted to what? Three areas of devotion. They were devoted to learning. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were hungry to learn. By the way, you think I give you these message notes every week for you to fill in the blank just because I don't have anything to do? Trust me, they take time, you know, that it 
takes resources to make it happen. I want you to be hungry, to engage, to write things down, to learn. They, they wanted the information and they wanted the application. Why? Because you cannot grow beyond what you know. I mean, sure, experiences develop you, experiences help you, but if you don't have your life anchored in God's word, your experiences can take you outside of God's word. So you've got to know God's word. You, you do not need to be entertained at church. You don't need to come to church and be entertained. I'll just be honest with you. I'm, I'm struggling with some of the stuff. When I go to church gatherings and listen to these, these pastors meetings and people talking about people in the world right now and how you need to be doing church, they're saying things like people have short attention spans. You gotta be, you gotta be entertaining. You gotta be really funny. You can't give them a lot of contact, uh, a lot of content. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, man, I lose on every one of those accounts. I, I'm just, <laughs> I am dug my heels in. Like, I don't care what y'all say. I don't need to entertain you. It's not my job to entertain you. You need God's word. That's what you need. You need God's word. <laughs> there you go. Entertain. Now you need God's word. Because it's God's word that's going to transform you. It's God's word that's going to change you. And if I'm honest with you, and ah, I feel like there's been some, some periods of time over the last 20 years in the local church across America where they started, started trying to turn to entertainment. You know what it produced? Illiterate Christians. It's the word of God. It encourages us when we're weak. It comforts us when we're, when we're wrong. It lifts us up when we're down. It builds our lives. It renews our minds. It's the word of God in a season like this that not only strengthens your faith, but gives you the ability to have faith. I want you in the word. I want you to know the word. If you're gonna come here this year, you're gonna be in the word and you're gonna grow and you have no choice. Period. I'm being silly, but I'm not being silly. I mean, I'm really serious. I, I've, I've never really taught the Bible like I'm teaching it this year. And, and I probably won't do it this way, the, the way I'm doing it right now forever, but I just feel like a push from the Holy Spirit about this. So they were devoted to learning. Number two, they were devoted to interacting with other believers. Let me re read this to you. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in Meals, everybody say food. <laughs> Your spiritual growth is not a do-it-yourself project. Let me tell you part of the problem right now with the American church. It's that we have embraced the independence of our American culture in our spirituality. And this is to our detriment. God never designed you to walk with him by yourself without anyone around you. There are some things that God wants to do, but it's only going to happen with other believers a part of your life. Church isn't primarily a personal experience where you get what you need and then you go out and, and live by yourself. It's community. It's people gathering together. It's, it's people doing life together. I mean, let me give you an example. Notice the prayer that, that the disciples say, Jesus teaches how to pray, and he says, I'll give you an example, and he gives them the Lord's Prayer. Think about the Lord's Prayer. You may never have thought about this before. Our Father. It's not my Father. He's ours. It's a recognition of community. Give us this day. Give us this day our daily bread. It's not my daily bread. It's not just about me and about mine. It's about us, and it's about ours. Forgive us. Forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Like as we're praying, we're praying for the needs of other people around us. Church is talking to others. Church is encouraging others. Church is praying for others. Church is building relationship with others. And it's living with others. Bless you. Some say, well, Pastor Dusty, it's 
It's just you don't understand. It's too big to meet people. Well, in any church that you attend, no matter the size, on average, the statistics say that you're going to know about 65 to 70 people. That's kind of your range. And it's funny, whether a church is big or a church is small, people act like, well, because I can't know everybody, I can't know anybody. Well, that's just not true. you, you got to push past that mentality. Another thing I hear is, well, I have a lot of friends, but they're, they're, they're outside of the church. And I got friends. Pastor Justin, I don't want you to think, you know, I, I got friends. But I'm just too busy relationally for it. Well, now you've missed the whole point. You've missed the whole point of why you are to be a part of the fellowship of believers. I'm going to read you a verse. It's 1 Corinthians 12. It says, all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you, each of you, each of you are a part of it. We're Christ's body. If a part of the body says, you know, I don't need to be a part of the body, what would we say that is if you're missing a part of your body? If the hand said, well, you know, I, I don't need the rest of you, you know, you know what we would call that? We would call that a disability. If the wrong part of you says, I'm done, then we call that death. I mean, if the heart says, I'm done. You know, I do all the work around here. I do more than all of you, and the hair just sits there. And I'm sick of it. It's like I'm pumping a bazillion times a day, never any thought about me. And suddenly, a few of those go missing and all hell breaks loose. <laughs> Some of y'all feel that way. <laughs> First Corinthians 12 says, this is kind of the gist of it, right? The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Listen. Every believer needs to be in a church, and you can't say, I don't need other people. Well, here's an idea. What if they need you? Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm a part of the body. I need you. I need you. This is why serving on a team is so important, because if you do it, you start ministering to other people. It's why we have groups. So that you can be a part of a community of people that pray for you and you pray for them. And the surest way to damage what God is doing is to become isolated and independent from another. We got we to work together. By the way, I say this as a pastor who loves you. If you've bought into the lie that, that you can just, if you've bought into Christianity alone, you've bought into a lie from the enemy. It's his lie that says, I don't need anybody. I'm good. Because when you're alone, that's when you become the most vulnerable. Here's the third thing that they were devoted to. They were devoted to prioritized prayer. Let me show it to you in Scripture. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. They were devoted to prayer. I'm just, I can't stop talking. I'm going to talk about prayer so much this year, you're going to be able to quote me before I say it. I believe that we're going to see exponentially more this year as we pray. More salvations, more testimonies. Why? Because as we pray, God works. And all the believers were devoting themselves, not, not just to personal prayer, but to corporate prayer. It was assumed that they would have had their own individual time with God. As, as they devoted themselves, they devoted themselves to seasons of corporate prayer together. You know, when we pray, there is, there is this building, this accumulating weight of prayer. It builds and it builds and God's, God does more and more. And that's what we'll see. That's why I, I say, if you haven't been to the prayer meeting, you need to come to the prayer meeting and pray with us. By the way, you know what I love? Last week, we saw 3,000 people come to the faith in one day in Acts chapter 2. They didn't pray for 10 days. 3,000 people come to the faith and then stop. You know, like, they could have been like, look at what we just did. But they believed God for more. Hungry for more. I love that. We want to see what God does next. So let's keep Praying. Is this good? Is this helping somebody today all over the room? Okay. Let, let me give you another uh, responsibility 
another responsibility uh, in prayer. It's this one, uh, is signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. Let me read this scripture to you. This is Acts 2. It says, a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. I want to say a few things about this. First of all, everyone, not just pastors and leaders, not just staff, everyone in this church is in awe of what God is doing. Everyone. I I want to suggest to you that without the awe here, we won't get the signs and wonders. The moment we're not in awe of what God is doing and aware of what he's doing, we'll actually see less of what he's doing. We have to have a sense of of what God is doing, an awareness, an awe of the invasion into a church that is unusual. By the way, I hope that you never lose that awe. I hope you never lose the awe when people are getting baptized, when people are getting saved, when people are getting filled with the Holy Spirit. May we never lose our wonder at it all. When we tell the stories about what God is doing in someone's life, that he saves somebody's, he saves this person, he heals this person, he, he restores this marriage. I hope that we always are reminded of how amazing the redemptive power of Christ is and how it's moving and it's helping people. Let us never get to a place where we're so used to it, that, that it's so normal, that, that we're no longer in awe, that we're no longer taken back by it. They were in awe of the signs and the wonders that were being done. And we don't know necessarily what the miracles, the signs and wonders were, but we will hear more about those in the future in the book of Acts. And I want to take a second, I felt like a leaning from the Holy Spirit this week about this, that I want to say that as we begin to walk forward as a church, as we continue to pray for the signs and wonders, listen, I want to say this, it does not negate the need to save the lost. In fact, that's why signs and wonders exist in the first place. But, but, but as we pray for revival, I, I want to say this, and I've said this over the last couple of weeks, I want to see the supernatural take place in our church. And I believe that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to, to, to prayer for signs and wonders to take place in our church. And here's the thing I want you to know. I'm not afraid of it starting small. Because that's what it does. It always starts small. That, that's, that's fine with me because everything in the kingdom of God starts like a seed. So right now, we're in the infancy of what, what God is really going to do. We're in the beginning. I mean, we're two months in. Uh, of, of this, this part of, it's the part of Jesus' ministry that God is developing in us. And, and I want to say that we have to be careful as we pray for it. We have to be careful... To, to, we have to pray to nurture it and never to become a naysayer about it. We have to celebrate it rather than evaluating it. I mean, think about this. If you plant a seed in the ground, you don't walk out a month later and expect there to be a tree there. That would be crazy. Well, in our church right now, we're planting seeds of faith that I believe are going to produce a harvest of breakthrough in people's lives. Breakthrough is, but breakthrough is growing right now. Fruit is, is growing right now. I want to tell you just, I mean, a, a miracle that God is doing that you probably don't even know about. Last year, so, some of you, were you at Seek Week last year? On, I think it was the Tuesday night. I can't remember if Tuesday or Wednesday. We were praying for supernatural. We were praying for miracles. We were praying for healings. And one of the things that I felt such a push from the Holy Spirit on was I said, if, you, if, if you're trying to have children right now or you've been having trouble having children right now, I want you to come. And all over the front, of this building where men and women standing together believing God for children. I want you to know that God's been answering prayers one by one, by one, by one. In fact, there are 12 core couples in our church right now that are pregnant right now in our church. Many that were down here along the altar. And I did not even, I did not even realize it. Because you hear, you know, that so-and-so's pregnant, they're pregnant. I'm thinking, that's great, that's great. Then I get a text message from one of the people in our church. Did you know that 12 couples since we prayed 
I started adding it up. I'm like, well, they, you know, they, I'm like, we're gonna need some, we're gonna need some nursery workers. Amen. Because here's the thing. Anytime you ask God for the supernatural, it doesn't always happen overnight. It's a slow supernatural work where we're planting seeds in faith and in prayer. Is this making sense, everybody? And, and when we begin to do our part in prayer, in faith, for healing and supernatural, holding God to his word, trusting him with his word. By the way, his word, holding him to his word about a situation in your life doesn't offend him. <laughs> he loves it. He loves it when you hold him to his word. I told my daughter, you know, in the middle of the first semester, I said, if you get straight A's this semester, I, I'm gonna take you to Lululemon and buy you something. I didn't know anything about Lululemon. I will never make that promise again. <laughs> but it's over Christmas break. She just had... She just had Christmas, and we're driving the car, and she says, Dad, do you remember you told me that if I got straight A's, I would get some at Lululemon? I was like, yeah. She was like, well, bam. <laughs> you know, as a father, what I didn't do? I didn't say, you little pipsqueak. What's wrong with you holding me to my word? No, no, no. I said, girl. We're going to go to Lululemon, and I'm going to get a second job. <laughs> See, if I as a sinner love to give good gifts to my children, how much more does your heavenly Father love to give good gifts to you who ask for it? <laughs> so we're planting the seeds. In the ground. I'm believing for Holy Spirit, the seeds of the ground for the supernatural, for the signs and wonders. And we're already seeing signs of it. 74 people two weeks ago said yes throughout the week to Jesus. And I hope you don't hear a number like that and think it's bragging. I hope that you hear a number and go, all that I have in my heart. Let us always have a sense of what God is doing because he's moving. He, he's moving in our church. He's moving in the people in this church. And as you begin to hear the stories, let faith rise in your heart. Let, let, because when the supernatural begins to happen, he's going to do something in your life too. And if it happens, please tell somebody. Let us know so that we can celebrate what God is doing in your life. Here's, here's the third one. I got these last two and they'll be short. The third responsibility that we have is compassionate care. It's compassionate concern for people around us. It says all the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. They sold their property. They sold their possessions. They shared the money with those in need. Now I want to speak to this for a minute. Some have taken this as a way that, oh, obviously they were doing this so we need to create a communal style of living, where everybody, you know, gives up all their property and puts it in one big pot so that everybody can have equal opportunity, but that's not what this is saying. They had their own homes, okay? They, they had their own property, but here's the gist of this. Here's what they understood, is that God has blessed us so that we can be a blessing. They understood that, that if God did something for them, then God was going to do something through them. Freely we have received, freely we can. God has given to me. He's blessed me that I might make a difference and give to others and bless them in his name. Look, I, I love the legacy offering, but, but that should never be the only season of our church that we as believers give to other people. When we see the needs of people, we should want to help people. So can I just encourage you, as a church, like this is part of our responsibility, look for opportunities to help other people. Look for opportunities to bless people. Look for opportunities to love people. 
to sow into people, to be available to people. Because they're all around us. A, a waitress at a place that you visit, a, a friend, a coworker that you see in need. And by the way, don't just give people money, ask their name and ask about their story. Because when you do that, it gives them a sense of value. It lets them know that they matter to you and that they matter to God. We don't just meet earthly needs without caring about people's spiritual needs. It's absolutely their greatest need. So we pray for them. All of us need to be looking for opportunities to help people. Why? Because there's a whole lot of people that are in need of help. And by the way, let me just say this. As our church grows... And as our church becomes known for meeting needs in our city and in our community, we are going to have people that walk through the doors of this church that don't look like you. Be okay with that. If the local church cannot give dignity and value because of Jesus, then where else in the world are they ever going to be able to find it? The early church was characterized by this spirit, characterized by this giving, characterized by this helping, this loving, this, this, this meeting of needs, and it sustained a move of God. Because it's impossible for us to say that we love God if we refuse to love people who are made in his image. And by the way, I think that you're the most generous group of people in the whole world. I mean, I really think you are. But maybe there's some of us in this room right now that are really challenged by what I'm saying right now to, to just, to maybe look around a little bit more, to ask, who can I help a little bit more? What can I do a little bit more? You, you may not have a lot. That's okay. Sometimes you don't have, you don't have to do a lot. You don't have to have a lot. You could just be interested a lot. Have time for people who have nothing to offer you. And when God looks down, he who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay him. And what I'm just advocating right now is that we have that kind of heart for people. By the way, that's who we are, Heartland Church, loving people to life. Amen, everybody? Here's the last one. Team, I want you to come. I'm, I'm wrapping up with this. The last one is aggressive evangelism. Let me read this last part. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And I want you to notice this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. I love God's word. Can I say something to each one of you? I, I thank God that you're all here today. But I really pray that there's more of us next week. I thank God for every person who's given their life to Jesus this month. It's been an incredible month. And if you haven't, I hope that today is your day but I really hope that next month there's more. I believe when Christians live in this kind of way, that's described here at the very end of Acts chapter two, I actually think it's the most contagious type of living that you can find. And it becomes the harvest field for a, a perfect move of God. When things get hard in the world, like they are right now in the world, Christians shouldn't be like, oh, here it comes. Christians be like, Hercules, Hercules. A couple of y'all got that. When things get hard in the world, Christians should get excited. Why? Because it's the perfect time. Right now is the perfect time. Because people need Jesus. At the restaurant, just care. 
Just invite them to church. Really serious question, really serious. Thought-provoking, hope it brings a little bit of conviction. When was the last time you invited a total stranger to church? When was the last time you invited a friend? Years ago when I was a youth pastor, I'll close with this, I came across a video online of Penn Gillard, who was who's a famous part of, of Penn and Teller, the, the magician group. And in the video, Penn said something that struck me, and it has struck me to this day. I have used this so many times over the years in youth ministry, and I want to use it now. Because this is what Penn said. He said, I'm an atheist. I don't respect people who don't proselytize. That's witness, by the way, in case you didn't know. If you believe that there's a heaven and a hell and that people could be going to hell, how much do you have to hate somebody not to proselytize? See, see, the truth is this. The opposite of love is actually not hate. I think the opposite of love is actually indifference. And if we really love people, then we got to do something. By the way, this month coming up, the whole month of March, such a great opportunity to invite people to church. Do it every week. I don't know if you notice, but you can't see our sign off the freeway anymore. You don't get the luxury of just saying, they'll just pass by it and see it. You know what that means? That means we have a responsibility. It's not going to happen on its own, everybody. God's great church, the number being added daily. By the way, the gospel growing, that should be the concern of all of our hearts. It's not just going to happen. It's only going to happen when you take it personally. When you take Acts 2 personally. And what I love about the church in the book of Acts is that 3,000 people got saved. And they stayed hungry for more. Friends, the only way we maintain a move of God is by staying hungry for more. Let's stay hungry. Let's take up the mantle of responsibility together. I want you to do this with me. Will you stand all over the room with me today? Today I've given our church four responsibilities that we as the local church have to strongly, strongly, strongly take into consideration. And I think the prayer begins when we ask God to get this in our heart. Light our hearts on fire for this. Make us so passionate about this, not just to your friends, but the people around us. Compassionate care, vibrant worship, aggressive evangelism, living in community, making a difference with a group of people that are making a difference. God, let that get in my heart. I want you just to lift your hands just like this all over the room today. Father, I want you to know that Heartland Church is not gonna be a church that has church on Sunday mornings and leaves out here and doesn't get the mandate. We are gonna get the mandate. We are gonna take it seriously. We want to be the kind of church that you started in the book of Acts. A church of tenacity. A church of prayer. A church of passion. A church that we're all in on, God. A church that we take very seriously the call that you've put on our hearts. And so we're asking together, collectively, all of us in this room right now, that you would move our hearts and compel us compel us to action, compel us to good works, compel us to care, compel us to give, compel us to make a difference. Father, we want that. But before it can ever happen outside the walls, it has to happen in us first. So Holy Spirit, do a work in our hearts. Change us, equip us, give us confidence to be bold with all that you're doing. And we celebrate what you have done but we look forward to what you're gonna do because there's more and we wanna do more so that Heartland can stand before you one day and you'll say to us, well done, Heartland Church. Thank you for loving people the way I loved people. 
That's our heart. May we take it seriously, Lord. Do a work in our hearts. With every head bowed, nobody looking around right now, maybe you've never made a decision in your life to trust Jesus as Lord. I don't know who you are today. I know some of you are going through a valley in your life. And you know right now that like things are hard. I'm, I'm struggling. My family's struggling. We need Jesus right now. First of all, I want you to know I'm praying for you. I'm trusting God for you. I speak life over you today in Jesus' name. I pray that his voice whispers strength to you, whoever you are. But if you've never made him the Lord of your life, I would be remiss right now if I didn't give you that opportunity to say, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. Say, Dusty, what does that look like? I'm just gonna pray with you here in just a second. But this is a private moment between you and God, but, but will you let me know who I'm praying for today? If you say, I need to make Jesus Lord today. Dusty, I wanna be counted in one of those, like in the books, book of Acts. I wanna become one of those Christians. There's nobody looking around right now. If that's you, you'd say, I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I've never done that before. Then on the count of three, put your hand high so that I know who I'm praying for today. If that's you, on the count of three, do not hesitate today. One, two, three, come on, raise it high. Say, I need to make Jesus Lord today. I need to make him Lord of my life. I need to put him on the throne of my heart. Yeah, hands going up today, saying, I need to make Jesus Lord. Yep, see your hands. I'm with you today. We're doing this. God's gonna transform your life. He's gonna do a work in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, now you can put your hands down. And I just want you to just pray this prayer with me. Now, remember, repentance is really a turning of your heart, turning of your life towards Jesus. But if you know without a shadow of a doubt, God is moving in you. I want you to know the angels are rejoicing with you right now in this moment. Say this with me. Say, Jesus, today I make you Lord. Come into my life and change me from the inside out. I thank you for your saving work on the cross. And now, Lord, as you've begun a work in me, let me be faithful to live out what you've called me to. Today I confess my sin and I repent. And I ask you now to be the Lord of my life and to sit on the throne of my heart. Come into my life and change me so totally and completely. In Jesus' name I pray. Come on, say amen. Come on, can we thank God for all of those people today? Praise God for you. He's working so much in our church right now. If you want, there's a resource you just raise your hand or, or maybe you're new to church or new to the body of Christ, there's a resource out at our table today we'd love to give you just to say thanks and uh, just to help you in your journey of faith. It'd be a real, uh, real treat for us to be able to do that. And so we'd love to meet you. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, we'll give you a Bible too, uh, just, to, just to help you uh, jump into God's word. I want to thank you, church. Tonight's going to be a great night. Uh, and uh, as we kind of get ready for the Easter season and for all that God is doing, I just want to take a second and say a big thank you to all of our building and facilities team. Uh, over the past three weeks, we've had a major amount of projects going on. Come on, can you just thank them? Like, I tell you, it's a very thankless job, uh, but you walked on to a property day where the, you had toilet paper and the AC was running, you know, and like you had a parking place and you didn't, it, it just, this place looks great. And I wanna say thank you to every person who serves on that team for making a difference. By the way, I want you to know that money that's used on this stuff, we've been saving that for several years now. None of that came out of the legacy offering. So just like let that like be a blessing in your mind. We're using that to make a difference in the lives of others, everybody. So if you wondered, don't wonder anymore. Uh, God's doing a great work. If you wanna give today, they're gonna put up different ways to give. Uh, on the screen behind me. I wanna thank you for being the most generous church and for supporting this church. If you're a guest with us today, don't worry about this. Let, let this service be our gift to you. There are boxes in the hallways if you wanna give that way. We don't, we don't pass buckets around here. It's a real thrill. We'll see you tonight at Dream Team Party for a great night celebrating all of our guests. Be with every person, God. Bless their family, bless their jobs. Lord, be with them. Let them get into God's word and pray. And we'll see them next week. Keep them safe in Jesus' name. God bless you guys today. Come on, team. Let's sing them out. You're dismissed. Just